So we're coming up towards the end of the year of 2022 and there's been a lot of games that I've been playing on the Switch. Mostly Nintendo exclusives, but also non-Nintendo exclusives like Sonic Origins, which I'll be discussing later in the video. And although the year isn't done yet, and I might end up covering the other games that are coming out for the rest of the year, I thought I would discuss my playtime with the current games that I've actually had a chance to like properly delve into on the Switch. And I'm gonna go in reverse release order. So I'm gonna go from the newest game release to the oldest game release on what I've currently played. And the newest game that I've currently played is Splatoon 3. But before I start, I just want to say a big thank you to Nintendo UK for sending me a bunch of goodies for the game. There's a t-shirt, there's a hoodie, I think there's a game case, there's badges, it's just a bunch of other stuff. Uh, it's pretty cool. And they sent me the game as well, so thank you for providing me with all of that, Nintendo. Doesn't mean I'm not going to be honest with my opinions, of course I am. Uh, so let's get into it. So, speaking of that honesty, I was not looking forward to this game at all. I was so down like against this game. It's unbelievable. So when the first trailer came out for the game, I was pretty excited because it was setting like the, this like apocalyptic like desert and like, look, like an upside down Eiffel Tower and it seemed like a cool premise but then they started showing stuff and it looked very similar to Splatoon 2. I think they started off with just some general gameplay of just Turf Wars and then they showed the story mode and they did this for the second game too but they like edit these trailers in a way where it's really weird, things are happening really fast, they'll show the Octolings and they did the same thing again with this and it made it look exactly the same. Like just one to one the same. And then they had the Splatoon Direct and it looked the same again. No new modes except for one weird side mode which I'll get to later and it's just like okay the only things we're adding are really minute stuff for a game that's coming out five years after Splatoon 2. I'm not excited for this at all. I literally have no, no excitement for this game. But I am going to play the game because I do play the game semi-competitively. So yeah, I played the game and most of my fears came true, if I'm going to be totally honest. If you've never played a Splatoon game, it's a good one to start with. It's the same as Splatoon 2, so you're not missing out on anything. There's some additions, like in Salmon Run, there's new bosses. And there's that card game, the new weird side game. At first it looked like a Tetris type thing, but it's really not. It's like a card game where you've got set patterns that you place on the board, and you have to get more spaces on the board than your opponent. And I'm going to be honest, don't like it. I think it's really boring. I'm sure there's more strategical depth, but I just could not get into it. I got incredibly bored by it really quickly, so I didn't play it for too long. So that mode was a bust for me. You've got lockers that you can edit stuff and add items. I don't know. That just seems kind of pointless to me. Just seems like a weird tacked on thing. And then it's just like regular game modes. You've got Turf War, you've got all the ranked modes like Splat Zones, Rainmaker, Tower Control. Clam Blitz, they're all just back from Splatoon 2. There have been minute tweaks, like for Rainmaker you have to get to a checkpoint first before you get to the final, uh, I guess the final checkpoint. In Clam Blitz I believe you have to get 8 clams to get a Power Clam rather than 10 from Splatoon 2. I'm like yeah okay there's some changes but it's, it's really, really minute. So for the most part, I was like, okay, this really does just feel like exactly the same. And even the new weapons that they have, they've got this like archery. I don't know what they call it in the game, but it's the bow and arrow weapon and it feels kind of weak. doesn't really feel that satisfying to use. Basically, you can shoot it and the arrows will explode on impact. So you don't have to like directly hit players. You can like hit it next to players and they may, may not realize it's there and they explode. It could be cool, but I've tried it out in the multiplayer. I just, maybe I'm just really bad. I just didn't find it very interesting. And then you've also got the Splatana, which is like a sword type weapon. That one seems more interesting, but I definitely didn't delve into it enough. And I, it just didn't feel too unique from what we've already got in the game. So yeah, those are like the new weapons and everything else is mostly from Splatoon 1 and 2. So again, even in the weapons department, I feel like they haven't done what they can yet. And I guess I need to point out yet 
because Splatoon is another game where they're going to keep on adding these updates and maybe they'll eventually add a bunch of new stuff to make it feel like a new game. But I'm recording this like a half a month after the game's come out, so I'm judging based on what we have now. So keep that in mind with my review of this. So yeah, everything I've said sounds negative, uh, and I'll add one more negative thing to the pile because I do have a good thing to say about the game, don't worry. Uh, the Splatfest. So the Splatfest now have this new tricolor mode, which is the closest thing to an actual new like mode, like actual battle mode in the game. Basically, instead of two colors, there are now three colors, so there's three different teams. And it's definitely an interesting mode, but they limited it to Splatfest only. It's not even like a new mode you can play, like a new casual mode, which the game definitely could have done with because right now there's two or four which is the casual mode and then the ranked modes are like the competitive modes so there's only one casual mode this tricolor thing could be another casual mode for players to delve into and it technically is but it's only in splatfests and i think that's a huge mistake because it's quite interesting uh because basically what happens is the third color is like in the middle of the map rather than on the sides and the two teams are coming towards them to attack them it's, it is definitely very interesting, and I want to have more hands-on with it, but they let me get to Splatfest, so I just don't get enough time to delve into it. I wish this was like either wrecked mode or casual mode that you could always play. So, yeah, I, th I feel like they kind of dropped the ball on that because it was an interesting new mode. And even like the icon shows the three on the Switch, like on the whole menu, the icon shows the three colors. It's like a selling point of the game, and it's limited to Splatfest. So, that's a shame, but... Here's good news, and I'm shocked there's good news here. The single player for the game is very good. It is surprisingly good. So, to give you some context, I did not like the single player Splatoon 1 and 2. I literally could not beat them because I got so bored. Like, I appreciated that they had single players, but they felt like glorified tutorials to teach the player the mechanics of the game. And like, that's fair, but they never really got that creative. So it's like, I'll play the first one. Oh, cool. How does the, how do the levels evolve? I just felt like they didn't. So I just got bored halfway through both of them, the first and second game. I've really tried to beat them, but I didn't. I quit. I just could not beat them. They were so boring to me. But Splatoon 3 changes this. So it definitely starts off. And they, they do this like fake out thing. It's not really a spoiler because it happens at the beginning of the game. They do this fake out thing where it pretends it's going to be like Splatoon 1 and 2. And then you go to this like Antarctica place. What's it called? Alteria or something? Wait, isn't that the Pokemon Alteria? Um, it, it's like an Arctic place. And basically the setup of the game is set up more like the Octo expansion from Splatoon 2. I actually never played the Octo expansion, but I did do my research and I looked at the mission structure and all that, and it's definitely based off of the Octo expansion, where you choose a weapon, you have to pay a fee, and the levels are like way more like gimmicky, and I don't use gimmicky in a bad way, I know gimmick has like a bad connotation, but I don't mean it in a negative way. The levels are very like set focused on singular ideas. So for example, there'll be a new special weapon like the, the web swinging one, I forgot what it's called, but basically you can like sling a web, and grab any surface, and there'll be levels entirely focused around that. It's like really acrobatic and crazy. There'll be a level where there's a bunch of these crates and you have to copy crates from the other side to match the exact same pattern. That level actually, I didn't know like that one at all. It's just a weird example I could think of. There'll be another one where it is literally just you're on a grind rail and you've got to use the splatana to destroy, no, not even the splatana, sorry, the, the bow. You've got to use the bow and arrow to destroy a bunch of boxes, but you don't shoot at the boxes. You actually shoot in the center of the boxes because the splatana explodes and gets all the boxes around them. It's, it's very good. It's, so interesting and they even do the really cool and i guess quote quote spoilers i guess it's a spoiler but they even do the thing where once you've played all the levels you unlock a secret final level akin to what they do in the 3d mario games so like super mario 3d world super mario galaxy 2 super mario odyssey where you unlock this final really hard level and that level was absolutely just so fun except for the last part the last part was really bad it was just like an enemy going on Blah. I'm not really a big fan of enemy gauntlets in games. But yeah, the single player had like a cool world. Like instead of just going to here's one hub world, here's another hub world. It's like technically separated islands in the same Antarctica looking place. And you get rid of this like goop stuff. 
and you can do the levels in any order, and you can skip levels. I literally went to the final boss before I beat like half the levels in the game. But then, because it was so fun, I literally went back and I 100%ed the single player, which I've never done in a Splatoon game. So, needs to say, the single player was awesome. If this was like a $40 thing on its own, I'd buy it. I don't know if it's quite worth paying for the whole game for it, but it's definitely worth a big chunk of money. If this were the DLC the release for the game, I'd be very happy and I'd gladly pay for it. So, the single player was very fun and they even did an awesome thing that catered to me specifically. My favorite game is Super Mario Sunshine and I, this spoils well. They put in the boss from the beach level with the stingray, that boss that had the, like the yellow and blue goop on the floor and you had to destroy all the stingrays and they got smaller and they like multiplied, they put that boss in the game. They actually did it. And then the final boss of the game is so cool as well. And the music is excellent. The music is much better in the single player than it was supposed to be in 1 and 2, in my opinion. So I'm very pleasantly surprised at the single player. I'm glad I gave it a shot because I, honestly, I was going to play like the first few hours and not, and not finish it because I really suspected it was going to be the same thing as between 1 and 2. I'm glad I gave it a chance because it was excellent. The single player of Splatoon 3 was excellent. It, it was the easily the best part of the game. And that's everything I've got to say on Splatoon 3. So do I recommend buying it if you've already played Splatoon 1 and 2? Depends. If you're a competitive player, I guess the answer has to be yes because <laughs> you're a competitive player. If you're a competitive player, you probably already have Splatoon 3. If you're a casual player, and you played Splatoon 1 and 2, I'm not quite sure it's worth it, but if you super duper love the single player of Splatoon 1 and 2, and if you super duper love the up to expansion from Splatoon 2, then you know what? I'll say give this one a go, because the single player was super duper good and very interesting, and I really hope the DLC for this game just expands upon it and makes it even more interesting, because I really love the levels and the ideas that they had in each level. It was so surprising to play these levels and just witness the new gimmicks that they would put into each one. And I love the final level too. The final level was so fun. So yeah, recommend the single player. So that's Splatoon 3 out of the way. I did not think I'd talk about it that long, but I did. So the next game that I played before this was Xenoblade Chronicles 3. This is by far the best game I've played this year. I love this game. This game is fantastic. This is probably gonna be my game of the year. So let's go on to the first thing that I really like about this game. The cutscenes and the cinematography and the fight choreography is excellent. It's crazy good. Uh, in terms of just raw cutscenes, I think this game easily has the best ones. Like, just, they are so exciting. Mainly the action scenes are super suspenseful. Uh, there's reasons I say action scenes, by the way, rather than like quieter moments, I guess. Uh, but the action scenes are basically just like amazing. The quieter moments are amazing as well, but I feel like the quieter moments usually rely on more of the story, and I've got things to say about the story. But even then, the quieter moments that are very character-centric and focused are excellent. I'm thinking in the chapter 5, honestly, just everything past chapter 5, holy crap, I mean, So yeah, amazing cutscenes and the music, fantastic. Like the music, Xenoblade has the best music in video game history, I will say that now. Xenoblade 2 has my favourite video game soundtrack of all time. This game doesn't quite beat it, and it's mainly due to the field themes. So basically, the battle themes in this game are like, just the best. Like, they, they are so good. Like, oh my god. Like, this isn't a spoil I have. The game's been out for ages. But Morbius, when you first encounter Morbius, which is like the big bad of the game, their battle music is the craziest thing I've ever heard in the history of my entire life. I got to that and I like actually flipped out. Like, oh my god. I was like, holy crap. I cannot believe this is happening right now. Like, it was the craziest thing ever. One of my favorite themes in the whole game. Uh, and just as a whole, the battle themes in this game are just fantastic. They are so good. They're so good. I cannot overstate how good they are. They are amazing. Like, there was a meme that I saw that was saying that the composers made each track as if it was their final one. And for the battle themes, I... <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. The thing that holds it back a bit for me are the field themes. They're really good. And I, I actually gave it some time because I knew that I would like them more as I listened to them more outside the game itself. The same thing happened with Xenoblade 1. So, it's happened again. But I still, still with that in mind, it's not as good as Xenoblade 2. Xenoblade 2, I mean, they're going for different things. Like, Zimmy 2's feel themes a lot more bombastic, a lot more epic, and that's more my style. And, like, I do like the quieter Mormon ones as well. Like, I really love the Fallen Arm music in Zimmy 1. That's one of my favourite feel themes ever. Fallen Arm is fantastic. And I don't mind when a feel theme is a lot quieter. In certain parts of the game, it will definitely fit there. But I just think in Zimmy 3, they didn't have a good enough mix of, like, 
epic tracks and quiet tracks because there's definitely moments in the game where they could have gone more bombastic and they kind of do like this was in the trailer so this is not a spoiler when you're on the ship they do really bombastic music totally makes sense totally fits uh, but there's points where I feel like they go too much on... And again, it, it's they're still really good, so this the music's still great. But it's just, in certain moments, I wish they went a bit more bombastic rather than, like, like slow and, like, focusing more on, like, the beauty of the world. Which, again, it's fine. It's fine that they do that. And I guess you could say this is personal preference, so it's fine. But for me, I wish they just had a bit of a better mix, especially when you consider that this game it's kind of the culmination of Xenoblade 1 and Xenoblade 2, and they have that literally embedded in the gameplay and in the story. Uh, they could have embedded that into the music too, but they didn't. Uh, I think they focus a lot more on just quiet pieces of music, which again, it's fine. And the music, no matter what, it's still excellent. Like from what they were trying to achieve, they achieved it incredibly well. Just personally, I wish they had just more stuff that was like Tantal. Or like Goma, or like Moradin. I wish they had just more stuff like that. But yeah, music is still like nine out of ten, like a masterpiece soundtrack. So it's fine. It's fine. It's just my standards are so high because Xenoblade 2 soundtrack is just the most amazing thing I've ever heard in my life. So <laughs> I apologize. So with the music out the way, let's talk about the world itself, as I was discussing a bit earlier. One cool thing, and I think this is actually the coolest thing about the world that is most unique to this game as compared to Xenoblade One and Two. I'm not including Xenoblade X in this comparison, though, otherwise Xenoblade X would probably blow this one out of the water. But the interconnectivity of the world itself, the way in which areas connect, is a lot more seamless and makes it feel a lot more like an open world as compared to Xenoblade 1 and 2. Now, there are still loading screens and such, but it's like, there'll be like this central grass area that connects to a desert, and it also connects to the Aegis Wilderness, and just things like that. The world feels a lot more connected in this game as it has ever, except for Zoom with X, which literally is an open world game. So that's the best thing about this world, but the least favourite thing about the world design is that it just isn't as... I just, it, might, it doesn't feel as fantastical. It's just not as interesting to me. Like in Zoom with 1, you're on two massive titans. You're basically on essentially two gods. That's, that's the landmass of the whole game. And that's awesome. That's really cool, like going on each part of the Bionis is pretty cool. The Mechonis, not so much because it's nowhere near as fleshed out as Bionis is, because you just go into the Mechonis field, that's what it's called, and you go up a massive elevator. It's still cool though, I, I, I get it, thematically I get it, but yeah, you're basically exploring each part of the body of these times. Uh, Zero 2 is kind of the same, but a, li a little bit less cool, but the cool thing about that is that you've got the Cloud Sea. And all the titans are like dying out, and it's like really interesting, it's really cool. And in Xenoblade 3, it's it's the combined worlds of 1 and 2? In my opinion, there's nothing too interesting going on. And this that might sound like a nitpick right here, but basically, one thing that was annoying me throughout this game is that there'd be a lot of parts in the game where there's a cliff and it just drops off to nothing. There's nothing below it, it's just a bottomless pit of nothing. And to me that made the world feel a bit hollow. Like, obviously in Xenoblade 1, you would have the boundless, endless ocean. In Xenoblade 2, you'd have the cloud sea. In this game, you've got nothing. Like, it's just nothing, you know? And I feel like they didn't really explain that all too well. Again, the world design, it's still good, per se. And I think the game does an excellent job at encouraging exploration. In fact, it's probably the most I've explored a world in a Xenoblade game. Well, actually, up until my repeat playthrough of Xenoblade 1, which I did right after this, I explored that game a ton. But... Before that point, yeah, I, I explored the world a ton because I just wanted to see all the little Easter eggs to the world from 1 and 2. So yeah, it's probably... I don't know. I might be alone on this. It may be better for people who are super duper diehard Xenoblade fans and can pick up on every area that is similar to an area from Xenoblade 1 and 2. I would much rather have something brand new and unique rather than just like nods to the past. And I'm not saying the whole world of Xenoblade 1, uh, of, of Xenoblade 3, sorry, it's just a nod to the past. It's not, but I do feel like it relies on that for a lot of its set pieces. And to me, it just wasn't as interesting as 1 and 2. And to coincide with that, my biggest... Actually, no, 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 no. I'll get to that a bit later because it's a bit spoiler territory. Uh, the next thing... Oh, actually, uh, it's the next thing I've got on here. Uh, <laughs> it's all right. Spoilers. Spoilers alert for Xenoblade 3. Skip to... Maybe I'll put a timestamp, I don't know. But yeah, spoilers for Xenoblade 3 now. So, my biggest gripe with the game, 
are the unanswered questions from the story. Uh, my main criticism is that the world doesn't feel fleshed out enough. So they go ahead and explain that the two worlds collided and that they yearned for each other. It never goes beyond that. It's just, they act like it's just this like scientific thing where the world is just, it's just like just a thing that's meant to happen. And I don't like that. I was really interested to see them explore why? Why did this happen? Did it have anything to do with Klaus? What's the context behind everything? How does this recontextualize everything I've been doing in the whole game? And I just feel like we didn't, we didn't really get that. You know, Xenoid 1, we learn about Xanza. Xenoid 2, we learn about how the architect literally built the entire world and built the blade and everything. And in this game, it's just the worlds collided because they yearned for each other. And just, that doesn't do much for me. Like, you had these annihilation events that they literally show in like one of the opening cutscenes of the game, where the collision of the world causes these massive explosions to happen throughout the land, and they even had these cannons in the story that did the same thing, and they didn't really delve into that at all. They, they barely touched on that. And this just goes for other things, like a lot of unanswered questions, like the, 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 the Lucky Seven is barely explored. It's just like unbeatable greatest weapon in the whole game that came from Riku. How did he get it? Don't know. What's it called? Because they, they, they were talking about like Noah gave it a name um, and they hated that it was going to be revealed and then it never was. We never find out the name of that sword. Ever. We never find out the name that Noah gave that sword. And it's like, okay, origin as well. I'm not too big of a fan of that whole origin plot line. I don't mind the idea itself of like this massive database storing like the memories of everyone from the world of one and two. But that in of itself is fine. It's just it kind of feels like they just shoved it in. <laughs> like, because they literally we only find out about it in chapter six. Like they literally, in fact, it might even be chapter seven. I think it might be the beginning of chapter seven is when we find out about it. But it's super late in the story where we find out about just this like, ultimate device. Like the ultimate device that literally, that's the main villain. Like the main villain comes from origin. The main villain are the people of origin. Like, and we literally find out about that last second. It's never like really hinted that. The closest thing we got was that they couldn't cross the sea because there was some whirlpool or something. And it turns out that whirlpool origin is inside of that. That's it. That's the closest we got, unless I missed something. And it's just like, how the hell did they build that? It's like the biggest thing I've ever seen. And they're telling us that it was built by Nia and Melia. How? Like how? I just, it just seems crazy to me. Um, I wish they built upon that more. The closest thing we got to the world being recontextualized is that we find out, and I think this was meant to be a revelation, that the world is frozen in time, which is act that is hinted at in the very beginning cutscene when child Noah is running around and everything freezes around him. That like that is the world that because that's the moment the worlds collided and time is frozen. And they're in the endless now. So that's the closest we get. I really like when Zuma goes super weird and it's like okay, in Zuma one again spoilers still Zuma one. We're in the passage of time, we're literally in space, thank god. Like, what the hell is happening? I'm climbing up this mechanical tree. And then in this game, I just... I don't feel like we got much of that. Origin was the closest thing we got there. You know? Uh, I just... Like, I wish we had more stuff like that, but this weird, like, sci-fi concepts. Like, I, I love learning about the lore and the story of these games. Oh, I, I just... Not on my sorry. I love learning about the lore and the story of these games. And I love just, like, the world's being completely, like, changed. Like... I love beating a game and then you replay the game. Now that I know this and this and this, this feels completely different. I don't really get that from Xenoblade 3. Maybe the DLC will answer it. Maybe I miss stuff. If I miss stuff and there's anyone here who played Xenoblade 3, definitely let me know in the comments below. The story, like, the story was good and the premise of the story is super interesting. Like, it definitely has, for me, it has the most interesting premise of a story in the series. Like, when it begins, like the opening cutscene. Playing this game was so, like, just... I don't know, it was mind blowing for me. Like, it was just crazy what was going on. It was like the craziest thing ever. Like with all these like flame clocks and forcing people to fight. And it was really cool. I feel like they don't evolve much past that. They keep on going on about the real enemy, the real enemy. And I feel like it, up until like chapter five, I don't feel like much is happening, which is why I say that the cutscenes themselves are amazing. Like just so action packed and like just so thrilling. But the actual story itself, I think it's the weakest in the Xenoblade series, apart from X, obviously X's story is like just like terrible in my opinion. But yeah, it's, here's how I would sum this game. It's the best game in the series to play, gameplay wise. Gameplay wise, it's the best game in the series. 
Story-wise, it's the worst. So it's basically pick your poison. Like, it's so weird for me. Even, like, stories, like, I really care about the story. Like, it's like, the story and the music is what I care about most in Xenoblade. But playing Xenoblade 3 was the most fun I had in a Xenoblade game, despite the fact that I know the story is the weakest in the series. So it's kind of funny how that happens. God, there's so much I haven't talked about. The characters are amazing. I don't know, I, I, I was hearing people saying that the characters were boring until Chapter 5. I actually really loved them from the very start, to be honest. I actually thought they were fleshed out really well. Again, I don't know if everyone had that opinion, but I know a lot of people were like that. But it felt like they weren't attached to the characters up until Chapter 5. I really liked the beforehand. And Meal, I mean, he's my favourite. I mean, everyone's favourite is Uni. I really love Meal. Like, I don't know. But to be fair, actually, Noah was the one character I thought was pretty boring until Chapter 5. Chapter 5 completely redeemed Noah for me. Like, holy crap. Like, an excellent job to the voice actors, too. You guys did an awesome job. And then the battle system, too. I guess that's the last main thing I should touch upon. Uh, battle system is pretty good. The big flaw for me, though, and I'm sure everyone said this before, is that they have, like, the two different arts. They've got the arts from Xenoblade 1, where you have to wait for them to charge up, and you've got the arts from Xenoblade 2, where your auto attacks will build up the, the meter to use that art again. And it's like, the Xenoblade 2 arts are just better in every single way. Like, you can use them faster, you're encouraged to attack, so that you can build up that. Whereas in, with the Xenoblade 1 arts, you just have to wait. It's really boring. In conjunction, kind of masks this a bit, but... Yeah, I I love the idea. I really like the mindset they went with for it. But I just don't think it quite paid off. I still like the Xenoblade 2 combat more. But it's still really fun. It's still a really fun combat system. And the chain attack's really fun. And the chain attack music is amazing too. God, oh my god. I've got so much to say. <laughs> this video, I wasn't meant to like go on about these games for 10 hours. But if you've not played the Xenoblade, play it. Any, any Xenoblade, well, I recommend Xenoblade 1 for this, but you can play Xenoblade 3 if you really want to. Xenoblade is Nintendo's most underrated, underplayed franchise. Like, I know, like, it's not completely, like, completely niche, but it's, like, not enough people play Xenoblade. More people need to play Xenoblade. Please play Xenoblade. Thank you very much. And that's my review of Xenoblade 3. <laughs> there we go. And I'm excited for the DLC as well. I wonder what it's going to be. Anyways, boom. Next game, Sonic Origins. So, I know I haven't talked about this game, and I know this game is super, super old. So let's talk about it. So I bought the Digital Deluxe version on the Switch. And like the main thing you get from this Digital Deluxe is I think animations on the title screen. And all the animations are reused from Generations of Forces, of course. So, bleh. Uh, my biggest criticism with the game is the picture quality. It's blurry and I knew this was gonna happen. Me and my friends literally like predicted this exactly what was gonna happen. Because the mobile ports had this thing where the, it wasn't like pixel perfect. There was like some anti-aliasing stuff going on and it made the picture quality a bit blurry and it especially happened on uh, the Steam release of Sonic CD. This was a thing there but if you play the decompiled versions of the games you could get the perfect pixel quality that you wanted and they didn't do that for Origins. They kept it blurry and they've not patched it since to add an option to get perfect pixels and make it look super duper sharp like in Sonic Mania. Sonic Mania does have that. So that's my biggest criticism of the game. It's just the picture quality is bad. You can kind of squint your eye and it's like, okay, it's fine. But it just doesn't, it just doesn't live up to snuff. It just does. It's not great. Uh, the new Sonic 3 music is not good. I really like that they wanted to get the, like, the, the unused music back. Like, I, I get it. I respect it, like the beta music, you know, but enhance it, make it fit in line with what we currently have, like finalized versions. Like, that'd be pretty sick, you know? New Genesis Sonic music. That's pretty awesome. They somehow butchered every single one of them, and it's really sad. Like, it's really, really bad. Like, not to be too harsh, I just... It's really bad. Starlight Carnival is probably the biggest offender. It, like... Did I just say Starlight Carnival? I meant to say Carnival Night. What is wrong with me? <laughs> Carnival Night. Act 1, especially, is, like, the worst. It's really bad. Like, it's kind of unbelievable they let this pass, honestly. I think Jun Tsunoi did this, and it's like, that is really disappointing, because Jun Tsunoi is, like, one of the most excellent composers and musicians in gaming history. And he made this? Yeah, I did not think that lived up to his usually very high quality. So yeah, the Sonic Mew 3 music is really bad. I know that's not a unique opinion, but hey <laughs> Um, There are glitches in the game. Uh, a lot of weird glitches. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but there was input delay for me, definitely. There was that weird Tails bug where Tails kept on jumping. They patched that, thank God. But it's nowhere near as bad as Cool Zone, though. I feel like I saw a lot 
more backlash for this game than I did for Colors Ultimate, which is kind of amazing to me. Because Colors Ultimate is like the worst release ever. Like, it's one of the worst Sonic releases of all time, bar none. It literally, seizure glitches, the amount of just gameplay glitches, visual glitches, the music not being great. Like, it's, it's bad. Like, it's like game crashing, save data corruption. Like, that is one of the worst Sonic releases of all time. And I did not think, or I mean, Origins, it's not great. It's not a great release. And I, de I don't find myself ever playing it. And I probably never will again, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I do kind of regret my purchase because of that, but it's definitely not as bad as Cold War. Cold War was just I, I still can't believe it didn't get that much backlash. Like that was a horrible game, horrible, horrible. And I like Sonic Colors, but from a technical standpoint, Cold War was just, just shocking. It, it was shocking. But yeah, is Sonic Origins the definitive way to play these classic games? No. Then it's worthless to me. I'd rather just be on PC and play the decompiled versions of the game, and Sonic 3 Air. Those are easily the best ways to play the game. And if you've got a Steam Deck, you can get that portability as well, which could be the one saving grace of Origins, but you can play it port you can play these other games portably in a number of different ways. So yeah, I don't like Sonic Origins. It's fine, the missions were kinda cool, the animated cutscenes were kinda cute, but again, only five minutes of animated cutscenes and that was a massive selling point of the whole game. That does not do it for me. And the fact that the game was very overpriced as well. $40 for games that are not like fully remastered because they just took the mobile ports. The only game that's remastered is Sonic 3 and everything else is stolen from everything else. From like Steam and mobile. Which they then took down to make you buy Sonic Origins to be the only way to play these games. No. I, I can't. I can't. I'm actually really sad I bought this game because it's a really bad practice. So yeah, Sonic Origins, bad. I did not, not like it. Well, I say bad. I mean, it's fine. On its own, it's an absolutely fine release. It's fine. Like, if you gave it to a kid, they'd like it fine. But if you're someone who really likes Treasures of the Classics, definitely do not recommend playing it. But hey, there we go. Sonic Origins. Nothing more to add. Last game I've got here, and the last game that I actually properly got to play this year, is Pokemon Legends Arceus. So this is the first game. Like, it came out January. So... Little, little setup. I thought Pokemon Legends Arceus was gonna be like the worst Pokemon game ever. Every trailer they showed looked so boring. They're literally just walking slowly, creeping in grass and throwing a Pokemon. That was the gameplay they were showing. It looked like the most boring thing I'd ever seen. And then the technical hiccups combined with that just made the game look diabolical to me. It looked so bad. I, I was convinced. I just utterly convinced. This was gonna be the worst Pokemon game <laughs> I've ever played. But it wasn't. Surprisingly, shockingly, it was pretty decent. Now, do I think it's amazing? No, but it got a lot more things right than I anticipated it would. So the main thing that caught me off guard and still catches me off guard now is just how mundane tasks are fun to do in this game. So they've got the research tasks and they basically reward you for every tiny thing you do in the game. If you catch a certain number of the same Pokemon, you get, you get a research task completed. If you use a certain move a certain number of times, you get a research task completed. Like it's just so many small things which makes everything you do worthwhile. Every little thing you do is doing something makes the gameplay loop really addicting. It's so easy just to hop on the game, just do some research tasks. Oh, I only play for 20 minutes and you end up playing for two hours because you're just doing these dumb, boring tasks that the game has made fun because of the systems the game has in the game. It's really good, and the quality of life improvements that they had, that they've added. Being able to throw a Pokemon out of Pokemon and just initiate a battle, being able to move around as well, is seamless. It's great. It works just like that. Being able to like power up on weaker moves is excellent. Let's say your Pokemon's a bit too powerful, but you want to catch a Pokemon, use a weaker version of a move to get to low HP. Genius. It's great. Just being able to run around, throw a Pokeball at a Pokemon, catch it, run around, throw a Pokemon at a tree, get the berries, blah blah blah. You can do so much multitasking in this game. So much. And it makes it fun and seamless. Now, again, is it the greatest game ever? No. The story is basically non-existent, the graphics are really bad, the world design sucks, it's so non-interesting to me. But, the fact that the gameplay itself was actually really fun, surprisingly, definitely redeemed this one for me. I'd still give it like a 6 out of 10, but I expected it to be the worst game ever made, so 
that's a win for me. And I kind of wish Scarlet and Violet was taking all the gameplay cues Legends Arceus had, but I don't think it is. So that's definitely a big no-no. But as far as Legends Arceus goes, I hope the next Legends game built upon what this game did well. Because it was actually really fun. But yeah, I actually think that's it. So that was a short one. So <laughs> I talked about some of these things for a long, long time. I apologize, but I had a lot to say. What games have you been playing on the Switch this year? Let me know in the comments. Do you like Splatoon 3? Did you think Zero Way 3 was the greatest game of all time? Let me know. And I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace out, my dudes.